1917 was a hilarious return to form in terms of funny sketches, and the writing actually felt clever again, and is genuinely good. With only 8 episodes, we start episode 1 with a detective episode with Nor Interludes, a defective detective. And while I personally am a sucker for the detective trope, as if you couldn't tell, episode 1 was a fantastically good one to bring us back into the world of Studio C. They welcome us with a new, new, new cast, a new intro for the season, and then hit us with a hilarious detective sketch. They've definitely done this trope before, but this time the repetitions were handled to perfection, especially paired with the sound effects, creating an environment of hilarity, and Jason being the main protagonist of the sketch nails it out of the park with his believable acting. Best skit of the episode, honestly. Throughout this episode, they have these noir detective interludes to transition between sketches, and although some of these quick jokes don't land well, it's meant for us to move on to the next sketch and not take up too much of our time on it. The transition between sketches 5 and 6, however, was a really good one that stood out to me. Speaking of skit 6, it was a Power Rangers parody. While I was skeptical at first since they have done a Power Rangers sketch before, this time it actually feels like a Power Rangers episode with the fast cuts, sound effects, and goofy editing, which works in its favor since the main joke genre in this sketch is juxtaposition. Skit 7 was a quick bumper called Studio Oopsies, a series that I would have bet money on that this was going to be a reoccurring bit like they've done in the past with other series, but I'm glad that this was not the case, because personally it was just not my favorite transition that they've done. It was just a crazy way to have a bumper that isn't just a logo across the screen and that's true with most of the transitions this season the ninth skit was a double dinner date I wasn't expecting to laugh at this one but it was genuinely funny due to how committed to I was to the bit and had a lot of joke types hilarious to finish off the episode was the last noir interlude what I love about this interlude is that it ties all if not most of the skits together in a crossover conclusion that was an amazing first episode and I laughed at every sketch except for burger bar I hope that this trend continues and the writing is just as good if not better so honestly, I don't have a lot of notes on episode two. An ad admonishing anthropologist. I had to look at my script because what is this title? <laughs> like I said, I don't have a ton of notes on this specific episode, mostly because the general consensus would equate to, you dude, most of these gets were funny, man. Which. I mean, they were. The notes I have are, I appreciate how clever the wordplay is of the second sketch about a job fair. And another really funny episode. I don't want to say this too early because, well, I'll probably regret it, but this season is actually good so far. Studio C is good again. What I will say is that episode two made me start to realize that most of the time I didn't laugh at the transition sketches. The third skit, How Do You Spell? and the X-Men outro sketch were my least favorite out of all the bits this episode, as well as the opening sketch with the outside diner. Everything else in the episode was funny. In my original video, I did count the transition sketches as skits because they would be on screen trying to be funny, which is the same point of the main sketches. So here, I also have to count them. However, considering this point, most of the time, I found myself being more negative to the transitions than the main sketches. Because for the most part, the main skits in this season are actually really solid. And at the end of the season, I guarantee there will be a significant impact on the updated graph, which honestly, I'm really excited about that. Episode three, A Secret Scarecrow is the Halloween episode. Because of course, you can't have a new season without new holiday-centered festivities. In the form of sketches, obviously. I'm sure you could guess at this point, yes, there is a new exclusive intro, and this time they took some creative liberties by using paper puppets on sticks. The good transitions that stood out to me this time around were between skits two and three, as well as between five and six, and man, the VFX always get better in this show with every season, both with the transitions and the actual sketches. Something I was not expecting was a country song out of nowhere, but it does match with the theme of Halloween due to vampires, so I guess it counts as a Halloween sketch. But that is not where I was expecting that song to take a turn at. Titled, My Blood Runs Red, White, and Blue, Dalton is the main star of the sketch. Not really my cup of tea, or should I say, cup of blood, because mine is right here. This episode is where it is further cemented in my brain that in between sketches, there is now a through line that tells a story. 
not that story, which I do appreciate, even if they aren't humorous some of the time. Obviously, I made that clear in episode two, but to be honest, every episode this season has that factor, which I do think makes the episodes better overall. <laughs> The fourth episode of season 17, A Terrible Tailor, has one very specific highlight that I would like to share that I don't think a lot of people realize. In the very first sketch, this episode is a hilarious classroom sketch where Jason is trying so hard not to break and it's killing me because Jericho is hilarious in the sketch. And then in the eighth sketch, Jason finally breaks and it's implied that this part was probably improv and I love it. Episode 5, An Elderly Embezzler, featuring Lisa Clark, who was the first guest of season 17. If you couldn't tell, each episode in season 17 is now titled a blank blank, and generally has the theme that ties through each episode with a conclusion that mentions one, if not most of the sketches, to make the ending more satisfying to watch during the credits. In this episode, there is a Lisa Show sketch, which while being hilarious, the reason for that is the commentary on content creator culture in terms of sponsorships. Which speaking of that, while I may have no sponsorships, I am supported by my producers and production assistants at patreon.com slash master ha <laughs> ha satire. Next is episode six, a bossy biker. The opening to episode six was a clip from the Oscars. And honestly, I can't believe Jason won an Oscar for best original score, not comedy. I mean, all right. At least it was a hilarious opener. In this specific episode, after skit four, is a nice look back of the show. Especially for us studio seers. Studio heads? Is there a fan base name? I mean, it was a little treat for us studio heads. I'm just gonna make it a thing now, you can't stop me. Then we have skit six, a sequel army sketch. This is my favorite of this entire season. Loudness, costumes, repeats, juxtaposition, awkwardness, and speech patterns combined into this abrasive back-to-back -back joking action that is so good. We then end the episode with a pet store sketch where one of the members breaks on stage. I absolutely love when this happens because you can tell they are trying so hard to keep it together. But sometimes when the funny concept is literally in your face, it is not easy to ignore it and say your lines. Episode 7, A Belligerent Bowler, featuring Mallory Everton, made me so happy when I realized that she was a guest. As a refresher, Mally was part Mally. Who is Mally? <laughs> As a refresher, Mallory was part of the original cast of Studio C from the very beginning, so to see Jason and Mallory back on Studio C at the same time was definitely a situation that I very much appreciate. Skit 1 reveals Mallory on stage, which made the crowd happy. The transition between skits 2 and 3 goes hard. No, I'm not going to play it because last time I did that, I got copyright claimed and then had to share revenue with whoever this is. And since the last skit this episode was about post credit scenes, the credit scene in this episode is playing on that trope. Finally, for season 17, episode 8, A Snowy Stuntman. This is probably one of my favorite Christmas specials in all of Studio C history, mostly because of the transition starring Jason in his house, which further escalates to increase the comedy, tying all the skits together, as well as made me realize that fourth wall breaks don't really happen all that much in this season, which I appreciate because in the later seasons of Studio C, they relied on that trope just way too much. Also, wait a minute. Did Studio C see my video? I made him some sugar cookies. <laughs> to the newer cast. Wow, what a great addition, Jimmy. You really spiced up that anecdote, made it your own, put your spin on it. Now, before we go to the graph portion, I want to mention season 17 as a whole. One of the reasons why there weren't a whole lot of notes is that I was genuinely enjoying my time with season 17 and was blown away by how good the comedy actually was. I had my initial doubts, don't get me wrong, but season 17 gives me hope for the next season and future seasons to come. Because at this point, you know there's going to be a season 20. They're just has to be. Out of the 64 sketches this season, I am happy to announce that 43 out of the 64 sketches were funny. After putting all the season 17 numbers into the graph, I am actually blown away. Honestly, this definitely shows quality over quantity because there are only eight episodes in season 17. Numbers of sketches are significantly less, but I think it works in its favor, honestly. Funny sketches, although it doesn't look like a whole lot of significance, it definitely is an improvement from season 16 and past season nine. It is the highest one of the newer cast, beating all of the seasons from seasons 10 through 16. Hilarious 
Hilarious Sketches shows a shocking spike. It's almost as high as season 9, which was the original cast's last season together. And even more of a shocking discovery are the percentages of funny sketches to unfunny sketches. And the percentage of season 9 and 17 are almost exactly the same with season 17 actually being in the lead, which is crazy because this now means season 17 beats every season except for seasons 2, 3, 5, and 6, which are Studio C's golden era. Before I talk about season 18, I wanted to take a minute to check up on JK Studios, the original cast of Studio C, and mention the film Go West, which I hinted at at a previous part. This film is a comedy set in the Old West with some of the original members of Studio C, narrated by Sean Astin of all people. It wasn't out the last time I talked about Studio C, and while I was originally planning on going to the theater to see it, I couldn't have included any b-roll about the film unless it was the trailers. This was my first stumbling block I found myself tripping on. Because while there are a list of places to watch this film, every place has this movie available for rent only, which can stop some people from seeing this film in the first place. I understand that independent artists should have the right to make money, so this isn't me complaining about the fact that movies cost money. I'm just explaining that there is a harder barrier to entry to even watch this film in the first place. The cheapest option is to rent it on Amazon Video for like $2, but since PayPal isn't an option, since Amazon specifically hates PayPal and does not allow it on their site, the only way is with a credit card until I found Voodoo slash Fandango movies where you can watch it for free but with ads. And if I ever want a chance at recording B-roll so I can dissect this movie to see if it even is worth people's time, since I am a broke boy that respects people's time and money, this is the best option for me. So after creating an account, it is now time to go west. And the first paragraph of the section is done. Purdue Distribution is the first thing that appears on screen along with Brothers Inc. and JK Studios. We open on a book where this place takes in Missouri. An intro montage introduces our characters and some people play multiple characters. Characters, which is going to be interesting to see how these characters are different from each other and means that almost every actor is from Studio C. Aveline's husband dies, Cora is her sick sister, and Aveline must reach the West before winter. Already the plot is kind of similar to that other unofficial Studio C movie that people were mad about where two women go across the country to see their family during the sickness. Elijah travels to the West with a cart he got from a salesman. You are as shrewd as you are strong, Elijah. The two main characters finally meet in a store, one of them being Robert and her store is under new management after her father died. While in the store, it is revealed that Abilene has a daughter who is getting married and has to visit her in the West. Robert is now going West since Abilene didn't pay enough money for her purchase. Hank, Terrace, the doctor, Charlotte, Joseph, Julian, and the captain are also introduced in the story and the captain leads them West. Abilene takes Cora with her even though Cora has dysentery. Wild West Holiday is hinted at here with some golf balls and golfers, which makes me think there is more to this movie than a Western. Technically there is, but we will get to it later because currently this is just set up for future events. Some of the music is oddly retro, but it works due to the connection of the Oregon Trail video game. So I don't mind it at all because the very next track is a plucking guitar. This is basically a comedic Oregon Trail movie. Usually the antagonist is always behind the main gang of the film and meets the people that they met first. Meanwhile in Wyoming, the Thieving Three break into a saloon, another antagonistic group, also known as the Johnny River Gang. Cutting back to the A story, Elijah and Cora keep spending time with each other, which insinuates that they may end up as a couple later, but we'll see, because this is yet another setup for future events. The group goes to a store to get supplies, but the store hosts a man named Mr. Carson, who gives them a side quest to kill a buffalo in exchange for the supplies they need. After accomplishing that by using the quest as a punchline more than an actual side quest, there was a song sung by Stacy which was hilarious for the interruptions. The main character and the main antagonist finally meet again. Robert attempts to get her money, but Aveline gets another letter, and Robert understands, although doesn't like it. Now the gang go to a family circus to blow off some steam from the stressful trip, and I didn't write this down, but it reminds me of that scene from Baldur's Gate where you like find this traveling carnival. Not much happens here, but a lion goes crazy. The Johnny River gang is with Robert, and a shootout happens, but all of a sudden, Johnny River's grandma, Johnny River Sr., shoots up a storm. Elijah gets kidnapped, and Robert gets the info she needs. The captain dies in sinking mud, and the group breaks up, so now Aveline and Cora are alone, headed to Oregon, but after a while, they meet back up, along with Robert and a third antagonist the beast, which dies at the hand of the golfer. No wonder they kept appearing throughout the story. 
They made it to Oregon, and everyone's story gets wrapped up in a book montage. There were definitely more people than just the main cast who worked on this movie, and it was a team effort in every step of the process. I'm usually not one for westerns, but since it was a comedy, and a well-written one at that, it does a good job at being an 1800s drama. The only negative thing that I have to say is that there are a few jokes that didn't really land due to subject matter. But other than that, it was a very enjoyable experience from beginning to end. And I do recommend it as a lighthearted watch. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go west. I was gonna wear the boots but you could barely see them in the shop. Now on to season 18. This is the season that contains the 200th episode of Studio C, the one where the original cast returned for the special episode. Since this is the opener for the entire season, I do have high hopes for this one, especially since I have already highly praised season 17 and JK Studios' first official movie. Episode one is an hour long special, which doesn't happen very often. This is the episode where they reference all of the beloved skits from the previous original cast season. So if you've been watching the show for the past decade like me, you will most likely appreciate it. 12 skits are present in this episode, and here is a list of all the cameos, instead of me reading them for the next two minutes, since every skit has some form of cameo and reference. There's a Marvel style intro which, given the theme of the episode, works in its favor by clashing worlds together. The names of the cast members appear on screen during the skit after the intro. Some of the goofy bumpers are just the cast interacting with each other, and some of which are actually old bumpers that they've used before. Now I would like to take some time to talk about the standout sketches that made this episode shine. They brought back not only a tongue twister, but also the one person doesn't have the script sketch twice. These two styles of skit are few and far between, and I always get excited when there is a new one, because it breaks the normal mold of the show to bring us something different for a change. Neither of these styles disappointed in this episode, and I am so happy they brought this back, because this was one of my favorite skit styles from earlier seasons, mostly because it heavily relies on improv, something that a scripted show like Studio C rarely does, especially when Mallory tries so incredibly hard to not break, and it's fantastic. The the other standout sketch has actually nothing to do with previous knowledge of the original cast. It is a Pixar mom sketch, which is something I was not expecting, but couldn't stop laughing at the very specific Pixar meme that they were integrating into the sketch. I'm just gonna play a clip for you because you need to see this for yourself. Oh, sorry, that's mine. <laughs> oh. All right, I will not stand for such a oh. Oh. Whatever, this is lame. I'm going. Tired of this! Oh. This is the best episode of Studio C in a really long time. Literally, every single sketch was hilarious. For a 200th episode celebration, they really knocked it out of the park with this one. I'm not even being sarcastic, I'm genuinely impressed. Put this into perspective, I've uploaded like what, 260 videos on this channel? Like that's crazy. Now episode two was a juxtaposition in terms of a number of sketches and humor. Episode one has 12 skits and episode two has six skits. And honestly, it works in its favor. Two of them I found to be kind of boring, but the rest were humorous. Honestly, I could sum up episode 2 with one paragraph. There's a Jared Shores reference in the background that only studio heads would get. The shark impressions were actually on point, especially Barbara. And this is exactly how I feel about Bluey. I'm pushing the off button, it's not working. I'm not going to prison because I'm a kid show. It's a lot more than just a kid show! <laughs> What did you say? <laughs> it's a dramedy about marriage, co-parenting, and the importance of play that just happens to take place inside of a children's television program. I literally bought two seasons of it on DVD. We opened episode three with a skit about a newspaper, and it's like a tongue twister sketch, but not as engaging because they just say the same words over and over again because they sound similar, and there aren't any stakes. Sketches three and also seven connect, where the skit gets more disturbing the more you think about it, and then later this is like a continuation of the family dinner sketch, but it's a separate sketch? Why isn't this part of the same sketch? In skit 9, they mentioned Gilmore Girls. So now they have mentioned both Bluey and Gilmore Girls at this point. 
Did Studio C hide a microphone in my house? Because I love both of those shows. I mean, probably not, just considering how season 18 is going. Because reference comedy wears off after a while. They're falling into this trap again of relying too heavily on parodies and also continuing these short segments that don't add a whole lot to the show in terms of comedy or originality. They found the sweet spot with season 17. But we are three episodes into season 18, and I'm starting to lose my confidence again in this show. How did you get here? If they were to stop doing these short segments and either make it their own skit so they can move on to the next idea or spend more time in the longer sketches, the show would improve because we have already seen it in literally the previous season. At least when season 17 had these shorter segments, they tied it into each other to create a cohesive storyline. But now we're back to shoving a bunch of random skits together again. These eyes on Hawkins segments don't make any sense if you haven't seen the material it is referencing. And even if you have seen the show like myself, it comes across as lazy writing due to its foundation of these jokes being the visual effects specifically. It is very clear that these specific sketches are written with the formula newsroom plus animal mention plus gaslighting plus visual effect equals attempted comedy and this combination of jokes becomes obvious after the third attempt speaking of reference comedy yo is that mario do you all want me to start yelling beef shakes again because if i have to resort to that to make my point i will however the Mario sketch actually does a good job at subverting expectations, as well as putting a unique spin on the Mario Brothers, so the comedy actually works. Also, if they aren't using a green screen or a blue screen, how are they doing this? I doubt they had the budget for the Disney crystal. Remember how I ranted about the last episode? And how I kept doing these weird Stranger Things sketches? Ah! How did you get there? Well, episode four does the exact opposite of that. Episode 4 has only 6 skits and most of them are really funny. Episode 3 had 9 skits and the Eyes on Hawkins skits weighed down the episode and also episode 3 is probably the worst of the season so far in terms of funny sketches or original ideas. In episode 4, there was only one parody sketch, the opener. In episode 3, there were 5 parody sketches. Do you see the connections I'm making here? Personally, there's nothing wrong with a parody sketch, so long as you actually have a unique spin on it and actually subvert expectations, which leads to good comedy writing. At this point is when I discovered the new episode name trend, blank for blank. This trend of naming episodes something different than just the season number and episode number started at season 14 with the disappearance of Jason Gray. Personally, I think this was a nice change and quickly informs you of what the team thought would be a good idea to name the episodes, like Edgar Allan Crowe. Season 17 is where they tried to do a similar style title for the entire season, a blank blank. Season 18 is a blank for blank for the most part. Oh, but Ethan, talk about episode five. Well, I would, but I literally only have one note and only one skit that I found to be funny. And now this episode is competing with episode three for worst episode. However, at least with episode three, I had enough to say about it. Here, it was just a forgettable episode. The only thing memorable was they directly referenced the original cast and the new cast in the trolley problem. <laughs> Come on. I'm the new cast. Her credits. <laughs> I'll do nothing. Oh, oh. oh well, the, the, the old cast doesn't pay my bills. So. Sorry, guys. All right, so... It's looking up again. This is due to the fact that Mallory makes a cameo throughout this entire episode, making it extremely memorable. Most of the sketches were hilarious due to the acting and writing presence of Mallory as a comedian and was a member of the original cast of Studio C. Overall, I definitely recommend this episode, but I don't recommend this camera angle. I'm never doing this again. Well, all the sketches were funny. Half of them were just parodies, which isn't a bad thing as long as they are executed well, which they are. The Indiana Jones and Jekyll and Hyde were my favorites, and the Jekyll and Hyde one was impressive from a technical standpoint. So, this is the last episode of season 18.
This one starts with a Jeremy cameo and then devolves into a bunch of different cameos in the form of a fake movie trailer. There is actual plot to this episode for once and it's the product placement episode where they attempt to impress a Hollywood producer. There's a new intro in the form of a band marching through. The soap opera skit was too predictable of a sketch at first but ultimately devolved into chaos and the trailer included Natalie and James and Whitney and Steven and Adam and Stacy. Episode 1 really carried season 18 in terms of hilarious sketches since all 12 were hilarious meaning half of the total number was from episode one number of skits went down a bit hilarious skits rose a bit and 40 out of 59 sketches were funny but there was a slight dip since season 17 and 18 were so close in terms of percentages i decided to simplify this graph by rounding either up or down depending on the percentage also it'll just look cleaner in general this means season 18 beats season 17 by a percentage again because of season 18's 200th episode 17 and 18 beat all of 7 through 16 so we know that there has been a rising shift of some kind whether it's writing comedy styles or cameos it also beats seasons 1 and 4. Season 3 and 18 are tied, and 17 and 18 basically beat all the seasons except for seasons 2, 5, and 6, which we've already established as Studio C's golden era, so of course it wasn't going to beat that. But man, I'm starting to think that the question we asked at the beginning is becoming more of a statement rather than a question. After dissecting both season 17 and 18, as well as the JK Studios' first official movie, I am definitely more in the camp of recommending these newer seasons. For sure, season 17 with its unexpected comeback, as well as its narrative, between sketches and season 18 for its 200th episode and cameos <sighs> all right i think i'm ready to confess it studio c is good again <laughs>